All righty, everybody, we're back for Chapter 8. Uh, I am properly caffeinated, and uh, we are ready to go. Thank, uh, thank anybody who is listening for sticking with me here, trying to get back on track and uh, <laughs> stay motivated and all that. Here we go. Chapter 8. Heroin Heroines. After the death of Wally Reed, Hollywood users did not break their habits. They learned discretion. One of the town's leading dealers was a quiet, gentlemanly actor on the Senate lot known as The Count. It was he who offered to fix up Wally Reed's hangover during the filming of Forever, who first put Mabel Norman, Juanita Hansen, Barbara Lamar, and Alma Rubens on the junk. The girl who was too beautiful, Barbara Lamar, was Hollywood's most glamorous, if jaded, junkie. She dabbled in every known variety of dope until her fatal OD at 26 in 1926. Barbara kept her cocaine in a golden casket on the, on the grand piano. Her opium was the finest grade Benares blend. Barbara, the southern belle brought into films by Douglas Fairbanks and the Three Musketeers, seemed to know she was not long for this life. Determined to make the most of it, she boasted of never wasting any more than two hours on sleep at a night. She had, quote, better things to do, end quote. She did, indeed, have lovers by the dozens. Like roses, she said, as well as six husbands during her br brief career as a star. The film titles of Too Beautiful, Barbara Read Like a Litany, Souls for Sale, Strangers of the Night, The White Moth, her last, her last incarnation as a femme fatale was in The Heart of a Siren. Her own heart was stopped soon after by a suicidal OD. The studio blamed her death on too rigorous dieting. After Barbara Lamar, the sensitive dramatic actress Alma Rubens lost her secure foothold on the ladder of fame to plunge into the night land of narcotics. The raven-haired star of The Half-Breed, The Firefly of Tough Luck, The Price She Paid, and Showboat became a real-life heroine heroine with most of her energies and a great part of her fortune devoted to securing drugs. Alma's addiction did not become public knowledge until a bizarre incident occurred the afternoon of January 26, 1929, on Hollywood Boulevard. She was, uh, she was to be seen running down the street pursued by, pursued by two men. I'm being kidnapped! I'm being kidnapped! She screamed, tearing off her hat and gloves as she sprinted and throwing them, uh, and throwing them into the gutter with her purse. She ran up to a gas station and sought refuge among the pumps. The two men caught up with her. Alma then struck savagely with a knife she had concealed in her dress, stabbing the younger of the two men in the shoulder. The gas station attendant managed to grab the knife while the older man locked her arms behind her. Alma, sobbing, was led off to an ambulance parked in front of her house on Wilton Place. When the story appeared in the papers, it became known that Alma Rubens had stabbed the ambulance attendant and that the older man was her physician, Dr. E. W. Meyer. Alma had panicked when they arrived at her house to put her in a private sanitarium. After a few, tr a few weeks of treatment at the Alhambra Clinic, she was allowed to return home with a nurse to look after her. In April 29, she lashed out at the, the nurse with a knife and was subdued after a tussle. Alma was taken to the psycho ward of L.A. General Hospital, then transferred to the California State Hospital for the insane at Patton for a six-month cure. When she left the hospital, Alma declared, I am feeling wonderful again after my rest. I am going to New York and try to pick up my career again, first on stage. Then I hope to return to Hollywood. Alma's hopes for a Broadway comeback did not work out, and while in New York, she filed divorce proceedings against her third husband, leading man, Ricardo Cortez. Alma kept her word and did return to Hollywood in 1931, but soon after her arrival felt a prompting to visit Agua Caliente across the Mexican border, driving down in the company of Ruth Palmer, a young actress she had brought from New York. On her return trip to Hollywood, they stopped off at the U.S. Grant Hotel in San Diego, where Alma was arrested on January, 20, uh, January 6, 1931, charged with possession of 40 cubes of morphine. The tip-off had come from Ruth Palmer, alarmed at Alma's outburst of violence. The, poli the police found the drug cubes sewn into the uh, seams of one of Alma's dresses when they searched the hotel room. When the cops entered, Alma screamed, I've been robbed of $9,000 in jewels, and this is a frame-up. I came back to California to make a comeback. Then this has to happen to me. After being charged, Alma was diagnosed as seriously ill. She was allowed to return home with her mother under constant medical care. Realizing she was dying, Alma called the Los Angeles Examiner for a last interview. I've been miserable for so long. I only went to professional men to seek relief from my pain. Each time they said, take this for the pain and you will be able to go on. But when they first started giving me this horrible poison, I did not know what it was. I went from one to the other. 
Uh, one even laughed when I told him I craved the drug and said, don't be afraid, uh, you will not need any more after you are well. But then they went on and giving me this thing, and as long as my memory held out, I could get drugs. I was afraid to tell my mother, my best friends even. My only desire has been to get drugs and take them in secrecy. If only I could go on my knees before the police or before a judge and beg them to make stiffer laws so that men will refuse to take dirty dollars from murderers who sell this poison and who escape punishment when caught buying their way out. On January 22nd, 1931, Alma died, aged 33. Another heroine heroine was the delicate blonde Juanita Hansen, the original Mac Senate girl who was introduced to drugs on the Keystone lot. The Count had approached Juanita early one Monday morning when she was suffering the effects of a boozed-up weekend. He used his usual opener. Hangover, honey? I'll fix it for you. The first taste was free. Then the die was cast. Soon Juanita was buying at $75 an ounce. Years later, she recalled meeting her connection in downtown L.A. at 4th and Spring, uh, 4th and Spring Street. Quote, A peddler, the same man who had met me that fateful day at the same spot and had sold me my first bundle of heroin. I had been his best customer since. The man was really a fairly well-known actor, though not a star. I took a dose right there. Doctors, the hospital, and the dangers I was running from meant nothing to me. All I craved was heroin. I bought a good supply. And so the Count led another star down Smack Alley. While Barbara Lamar and Alma Rubin somehow escaped the Doom Book blacklist following the, de the death of Wally Reed, Juanita Hansen was not so fortunate. Her name was found in a letter of an Oakland doctor with whom she had sought treatment, and soon after Reed's death, she was arrested and held in jail for 72 hours to determine if she was on the stuff. At that time, she was not, but the headlines finished her career. Juanita, the daredevil serial queen and star of The Lost City, hit the oblivion trail. Her comeback was not in the movies, but as founder of the Juanita, Fa uh, Juanita Hansen Foundation, whose avowed aim was to urge doctors to wage war against addiction as they now crusade against syphilis. And that is the end of chapter eight. I appreciate y'all listening. I was fascinated to get to this particular chapter because before I started reading this book, I had seen the movie Babylon, starring Margot Robbie and Brad Pitt, as well as a variety of other actors. And it's a very interesting film in terms of it does take some inspiration from some of these stories in addition to all of the wild party stories you heard about in old Hollywood. Um, there is a character in the movie that is called simply The Count. I don't believe you do learn his name at any point. And there's uncertain uh, there's there's some skepticism as to whether the count was a real person i have no doubt having met personalities in my lifetime today there probably was an actor who nickname whose nickname privately was the count and who could hook people up because there's always those kinds of people there still are in hollywood and um his character felt very out of place in the movie only because of the actor and i didn't realize that until i had watched it a couple times but other than that particular actor and the way he looks and sounds it's very uh very out of place for 1920s Hollywood, but I think that's just, you know, they, they hired a comedian instead of somebody to embody the character kind of thing. If you are interested in looking into it, I was not able to find much on who the Count actually could have been in real life, so skepticism abound. But either way, we've gotten to that particular character, and I just, I, I find it very bitter and realistic and fascinating that, yeah, there was probably this personality who was doing these things back in the day. Anyway, that is the end of Chapter 8. I appreciate y'all getting this far.